So it is 7.34 p.m. It is Tuesday, May 24th, 2022. Good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. And I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. I'd like to confirm that all members and anticipated officials are present. So members of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Daniel Riccadelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Venkat Holly. Here. Great, great to have you all. On behalf of the town, uh, Rick Valorelli, our administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Valorelli. And uh, Vincent Lee as well. Here. Good to have you with us. And then appearing on behalf of 30 Venner Road, um, Ayan Chaturi. I'm here. You're here. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, appearing for 44 Edmund Road, uh, James Cyper. Hi. Have you with us? Um, and then appearing for 39 Tuft Street, um, this is Zachary Heath, trustees and KRS contracting. Here. Perfect. And then uh, the fourth hearing uh, that was scheduled for tonight, 82 Grandview Road, they have requested a continuance. Um, <clears throat> so we will, we're not anticipating their presence tonight. <clears throat> So this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures signed into law on February 15th, 2022. This act includes an extension until July 15th, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may continue to meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during the public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via the Zoom application with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference. Others are participating by computer audio or by telephone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name, or another identifier. Please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. And we ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. As chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As a board will be taking up new business at this meeting, as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. <clears throat> Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals of the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. The first item on our agenda this evening, so the <clears throat> uh, items two through nine are approval of minutes. I'm gonna hold off and do those at the end. Um, which will bring us up to the hearings. Uh, turning to the public hearings on tonight's agenda, here's some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I will ask the applicant to introduce themselves or themselves and make their presentation to the board. I will then request members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. At the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on the matter. So with that, I... We will move on to item 10 on our agenda, which is docket number 3697, 30 Venner Road. And so I would ask the applicant to introduce himself and tell us what he's looking to do. So thank you. Um, I am Ayan Jaduri. I um, live in Arlington, 30 Venner Road. Uh, I've been about 11 years. And uh, our proposal today is uh, for building an ADU uh, for my mom, who, uh, who we're planning to move from India. She's um, 72 years old and aging. So the proposal here is to build an ADU for her. 
And uh, I, I, from my understanding is the ADU is, uh, you know, by right now. And, uh, however, uh, there seems to be a discrepancy in uh, at least our understanding of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the limits to the property line. And so I think uh, our, our, our proposal here is that the variance seems to be for uh, 10 feet for an attached ADU, whereas uh, 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 apparently for a detached ADU, it is six feet. We are asking for is a variance uh, for having us go to six feet of property line um, for this particular proposal. Um, the rest of the thing all online. Is there anything I want, uh, anyone has which I want? Um, or, I mean, any, anything more specific which I should get into? Um, I can go ahead and uh, display the plan. And so this is the, the plan of the backside of the house. So just make sure I'm following this correctly. So this is your existing house here. That's correct. And this is the, the ADU. That's correct. You're requesting. That's and correct. you're also adding this deck as well. That's correct. Okay. Um, so that's the proposed elevator to so the Yep, so it's the proposed left side elevation. The section through the, the ADU with the deck on the top. Detail at the front wall. The second floor level with, of the house and the deck over the top, the dwelling unit. Details of the porch. plan, framing plan, <clears throat> and then this is the site plan. I've been adding a couple of notes onto here. So, um, so there's a couple of things. Is there anything else you, you want to specifically bring our attention to? Uh, not really. I think uh, what I wanted to say is, you know, the, the, the backside is frontage road, which is, uh, you know, the ramp of route two. Uh, of the property. So, you know, we already, I think at six feet, uh, you know, from, from for a long time there. Mm -hmm. So the, as he notes the back, the, the, they have Venter Road on the front and Frontage Road on the back. So it's technically a through lot. So it has a two fronts, has a front on Frontage Road and it has a front on Venter Road and two sides and no rear. Um, So the, it looks from here that the existing house is nine feet from the rear property line. That's good. Okay. And uh, you have a shed at the back. So there's, but there's currently no deck. That's good. Okay. And just the driveway coming through. Yeah. Okay. So as, as was previously noted, so the, the accessory dwelling unit is a new bylaw for the town as of last year. Um, and this is the first time that an accessory dwelling unit has come before the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, there's, <clears throat> then as the applicant had noted, there are different, slightly different rules for if you are doing um, an accessory dwelling unit in a detached accessory building like a garage versus if you're doing it as a piece of the house. Um, so here it is connected to the dwelling unit. So this is an extension of the existing house. Um, <clears throat> and per the way that the, the bylaw is sort of defined, uh, we are to treat, uh, this is still considered um, a single family dwelling as far as the zoning is concerned. Um, it is considered a two family dwelling as far as the building code is concerned, um, which only the building, the building um, permit issues would only pertain to inspectional services and, and their review. It has nothing to do with our review. So this being 
um, a front and this being a front. So clearly the house is already within the, the setback um, along the backside and <clears throat> under uh, state law and the town bylaws, um, you are allowed by right to, to be in the back, in the, um, in the setback up into the existing nonconformity, which would be nine feet. And then beyond that um, can be allowed by the town or by the zoning board of appeals uh, with a determination that it is not substantially more detrimental. Um, so we would need to sort of discuss the, the proximity to uh, the frontage road front yard. The other issue is <clears throat> Uh, the six feet off the side lot line. So the current side, the side yard setback in the zoning district is 10 feet. Um, and that can be, um, <clears throat> and currently the setback is far greater than, than 10 feet. So to extend the house to six feet off the side lot line creates a new nonconformity um, with regards to zoning. And as the applicant had noted, that this is, if you, this was a detached building, if this was an accessory garage and it was six feet off of the line, um, that would not be an issue. Uh, but because it is attached to the house, the zoning bylaw um, does treat it slightly differently. And so um, that's something we need to, to pay attention to. Um, are there Questions and comments from the board. Um, I was going to switch away from this and bring up the the section of the zoning bylaw. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Mr. Mills, um, in regard to the addition, in uh, it's eight feet off the lot line. How close is the next residence over? That's at twenty six Vernier Road. How close is that building? Do we have any clue? Um, we can ask our good friends at Google Maps. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, I happen to have a... Uh, photograph of it which oh. some difficulty I could put up but not quickly um, but when you look at the there's a fence and, and uh, Mr. Prodry could correct me if I'm wrong but there's a fence um, there's a fairly wide uh, green space between the driveway and a fence and then a brick house that is located very near to the fence on the other side. That is correct. Notice this before on Google Maps, for whatever reason, there is no street view directly in front of this property. <laughs> it, wow. jumps, it jumps by about four houses for some reason. Um, I could look it up on the through the town's website, but um, I can't tell specifically from here. <clears throat> I mean, I could share the photograph with Mr. Valorelli or someone else who would know how to put it up on the screen. But we, we can do that, Mr. Hammond. See if I can do that. Should be good to go, Mr. Hammond. All right, so I'm sending it to you. Actually, if you could send that to Vin Lee, he has uh, better technology than I have on my end. Okay. Or, or is it possible uh, to send it to Christian? I don't know if yep. that would be easier for you. I can, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure that I 
can send it to Vin because I'm not sure that I have his. Why don't you go ahead and send it to me? Hold on. Christian, I know I have his. <laughs> All right, I sent it to the uh, Arlington, the official Arlington site. Perfect. It's headed there now. See, there always is this benefit of going out and looking at things for fun. So, Mr. Valerelli, I should point out that I've got a message here saying that the Susan Ann Taylor has entered the waiting room and is looking for admittance. Okay, got it, Mr. Hammond. Is that okay with you, Mr. Chairman, Susan Ann Kaler? Beg your pardon? Is that okay with you to admit Susan Ann Oh, yeah. Kaler? Okay, that's done. Let's see if I can image. Share screen. Oops, I gotta open it first. Sorry. Desktop. Image. Okay. okay, so. Zoom meeting. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Seltzer. Oh, oh, never mind. I was just going to offer that that there was a Google Street View from the frontage road, but now I see you have a, a better one from the front. Ah, thank you. So this is the the applicant's house, the car in the driveway, and then there's the fence. <coughs> and then is the fence on the the fence directly on the pipe the plot lot line as far as we know it's a one inch inside okay yeah. So the adjoining, the house next door is pretty much biased towards the lot line, it, it appears. It looks like it's, I don't know, close to the setback if it is yeah. 10 feet away. It does, a, on, uh, on, the, on Google, it does appear to be very close to the lot line. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I speak? How do I participate? Click there. Hello? Hi. Um, if Hi. If you're a member of the public, we will, we will call for public participation, and you can raise your hand at that point. Okay, but we're the neighbors. Okay. Uh, not the house that you're talking about, but we'll wait. No problem. You can answer your question. Um. Uh, I will share, this is the bylaw on accessory dwelling units. Um, so for the, the basic requirements, uh, has to have a floor area, not larger than half the floor of the principal dwelling or 900 square feet. In this case, it's just under 400 square feet. Um, so that's not an issue. Um, an alteration causing an expansion or addition to a building in connection with accessory dwelling unit shall be subject to the provisions of section 542B6, which is the large additions, which applies to additions that are greater than 750 square feet, which this would not apply in this case. Um, an accessory dwelling unit shall maintain a separate entrance, either directly from the outside or through an entry hall. And this does maintain an, ex uh, an independent entry. Uh, no more than one accessory dwelling unit 
per principal dwelling unit, which is the case here. Um, and then this, I think, is the, the part that's at question, which is so an accessory dwelling unit may be located in the same building as a principal dwelling unit or as an expansion to such a building, which it is in this case, a building that is attached to the principal dwelling unit or an accessory building, which accessory building shall not constitute a principal really by the incorporation of the accessory dwelling unit provided if such accessory is located within six feet of a lot line and then such accessory dwelling unit shall be allowed only if the Zoning Board of Appeals acting for 233 grants a special permit. So in this case, that it seems fairly clear that um, that subsection triple uh, I there is talking about an accessory building, which this is not. This is very clearly the same, an expansion to an existing building. So I think this six foot, my sense is that the six foot rule does not apply in this case. And as proposed um, with the addition being only six feet from the side lot line, that that is a new nonconformity and therefore would require um, a variance to be granted in order to allow that to be done. Um, and I would ask other members of the board what their sense is on that. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, I sort of remember the process that led to this uh, amendment to the zoning bylaw pretty well since I was fairly close to the proponents. Um, and there's a very good reason why little Roman numeral three is different. Um, if you'll remember, and uh, all of the, it was always emphasized at town meeting that uh, the accessory dwelling units would not, uh, would, would all have to conform with the, what is otherwise applicable in the zoning bylaw. So you wouldn't be able to sort of expand into a required setback or, or anything of that kind. But there was one problem that was a little different, and that is what is addressed in Little Roman numeral three. It was envisioged that sometimes an ADU might be a conversion of a garage. And sometimes a garage uh, can be within six feet of the lot line. So they had a special rule for separate buildings, i.e. principally they were thinking of garages that would allow it as long as it was by special exception, if uh, up to this, excuse me, allow it up to six feet and then a, a special exception uh, thereafter. So there's a pretty big distinction between little Roman numeral two and little no Roman numeral three. And at least it's my sense that you can't really consider two as if it were three um, because in a way that violates the whole premise under which the town meeting acted, which was the ADUs had to fit within the zoning bylaw as it already existed, and uh, were and there was no independent authorization really to do something, uh, something that would be different. And obviously, this is a case in which the the uh, the appeal of, of being able to give an ADU is probably to its maximum extent. Um, but I don't believe that we have the authority to do that as a special unit as a uh, as a special permit, if it could be done at all, it would have to be done as a variance, which as the body knows has its own problems. Thank you, Mr. 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 Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So I agree with uh, what Mr. Hanlon said, and I really just sort of tried to absorb this new provision today. But as we're talking about this, and in this specific context, it strikes me that we may well be faced with people coming in and saying, you know, I can't do this without a variance. And it's going to be an interesting analysis for us if we're in that position to try to discern whether or not you know, the conditions, uh, primarily, you know, the new provision itself saying that, you know, that ADUs are actually something that are desirable is going to give 
sufficient bases for us to then turn around and say, well, given the desire on the part of the town to allow these, should that then give us additional, uh, you know, additional basis for allowing a variance? And I'm, I'm just throwing that out there as a question because I, I suspect that we're going to be facing this sort of fact pattern again, and we're going to have to make a determination at some point whether or not just the mere fact of trying to build an ADU gives somebody a leg up when it comes to requesting a variant. So I, I don't have an answer to that, but it does occur to me as I'm listening to this that we may well be faced with that as time goes on. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. So as you'll remember, the fourth requirement for a variance is that it's consistent with the purpose of the bylaw. And it seems to me that the ADU ordinance may, or the ADU amendment may help our analysis there. Um, I'm not sure that it would have a bearing on hardship. I must say that I would be uncomfortable in being asked to administer this and distinguishing between different reasons people have for establishing an ADU. Um, I, obviously, some things are more appealing to people but we don't usually take that sort of individual circumstance into account. If this were an ADU in which someone wanted to rent something to uh, a college student to, for the extra income, um, the, the ordinance allows that and the bylaw allows that. And uh, I don't want, I don't think that we should be invited under the guise of determining hardship to distinguish between more and less meritorious acts, uh, applicants uh, for an ADU. That, that kind of gets into a, something that I don't think that you're supposed to do under the variance. And it's profoundly uncomfortable because everybody's judgment as to sort of the moral or, or emotional or, or just the policy justification of one kind of use or another uh, would, would become a very, it would be a, a sort of a rubbery ruler for us uh, in figuring out what we should do. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Dupont. So I have a question for Mr. Valarelli, and that is, could someone come in here and construct a garage uh, six feet away from the lot line at this point as a matter of right? Mr. Valerie? I don't know, Mr. Dupont. I, we start to get into lot coverage details, among okay. other things. Um, if it were not, I mean, if, it were, if they were just asking for the garage and not, not uh, an addition, uh, yeah, I see it possible, but on, on top of what they're asking, uh, just looking at it real quickly, uh, there'd be lot cover issues, uh, as well as uh, potentially some other um, zoning uh, issues that they would need relief from. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I just thank you. I, I just think in terms of down the line, if people have the uh, the needed lot size so that they could construct a uh, an accessory building such as a garage, they could do that and then do the ADU from that point on. That would be it. Well, that would be a tough one, Mr. Dupont. So if I understand you correctly. Um, if the proposed addition were granted tonight, then down along the line somewhere, they want to add an accessory garage structure. Is that what you're asking? Well, me? I'm just, no, I'm not even thinking specifically about this particular case, but in the event that you do have, um, you do have a similar situation where lot coverage is not going to be a problem. Somebody conceivably could build an accessory uh, building such as a garage. And then after that's actually in place, could apply to us for an ADU or is uh, sorry to, um, sorry to you finish your question so that was it so somebody could conceivably construct a garage and then uh, after it's built turn around and ask for an ADU they could so it, it all depends on the lot size so we're looking at a 5,000 little bit of change a square foot lot but yep. if somebody had a substantial lot uh, they could in fact okay thanks it's possible yes just want to stress that it doesn't already I mean while the while people were envisioning the garage because that can be built with by right within six feet of a lot line if in fact 
if it's done in the right way. But there's nothing that requires you to build a garage first. Uh, you could build an independent building uh, that would be an accessory building and destine it for an ADU right from the very beginning. They, if I don't know what other things they may violate, but that could be done here as well um, if, if the applicant wanted to do that. Um, but you do have to have a separate building in order to in order for number three to <coughs> to apply. Uh, I have a question for the the applicant. If I was just curious if they had looked at um, any orientations of the the addition that maintained the ten foot step back off the lot line. Yeah, so we definitely tried that. Um, again, you know, this is for my mom who's kind of lived by herself for 20 years. I mean, I'm an only child. Yeah. She, she values her independence. Uh, so, you know, she wanted, you know, you know, this is basically, you know, her kind of will in trying to figure this out. <coughs> and, you know, I mean, you know, with, with COVID and everything, it's, it's become more and more important for her to kind of be with her family which is, you know, she's been by herself for the past three years. Okay. But, um, uh, you know, so we tried. I mean, we definitely didn't want to, you know, come to this stage. And we really, really tried to kind of bring it down to like the 10 feet setback. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you can see, even with the designs now, it's pretty cramped, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, just a, a kitchen, a bathroom, and a, a bedroom. Right. And, um, so, you know, I mean... We, we definitely try. Okay. Are there further questions from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cadelli. So, so um, in absence of, uh, thank you, Mr. Kahnema, for explaining the intent of the, the um, ADU regulations when they were written. Um, so in absence of um, a specific limit for uh, little Roman numeral two and one, on that list, then we should just be considering this, uh, even though it's an ADU, as uh, an addition that would interfere with a, a lot setback, right? W would that be a correct assessment? Mr. Hanlon? I think that's correct. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, and then, other question before the, it's not specifically raised before the board. Um, <clears throat> so on the, is the position of the rear deck. Um, so the rear deck is actually not a rear deck, it's a front deck, because this is a, again, the front property line. Um, and so it's supposed to have a full setback like it does at the front. Um, now, the in the zoning bylaws under 539B, um, unenclosed steps, decks, and the like, which do not project more than 10 feet in the front yard or more than five feet in the side yard beyond the line of the foundation wall may extend beyond the minimum yard regulations otherwise provided for the district which the structure is built. Um, so in this case, it does not, it, it extends seven foot 10 from the built, from the foundation wall. So it does not extend more than 10 feet. Um, so I think by my reading here, even though this is the front yard and not the rear yard, that I, I think that the, the deck meets that requirement um, and would therefore be allowed in the yard. Are there other, any other questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, I have a question. That, Mr. Hanlon. Um, so sometimes when you can't move out, you can move up. And I'm certainly not, a, unlike the rest of you, I'm not an architect and don't have any sense for what, what that might mean. But this is a one-story structure. And I wonder if there's any way of 
pulling it back and then building it up so that you get additional space instead of having a deck on top of it you have a, a second floor or something like that I'm, I'm i'm basically trying to think of ways that you could go about doing something and i recognize being even older than 72 myself that going up and down a stair is not an ideal thing for an elderly person but um but it, it, it may be that one needs to look to unconventional things to figure out a way of fitting this uh, into, the, into the property that, that the applicant has. So I think at this time, <coughs> we're ready for uh, comments and questions from the public. So, uh, Public questions and comments are taken as they relate to the matter at hand and should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing our decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. The chair asks that those wishing to address the board a second time during a particular hearing, please be patient and allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead of them. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. So we called upon... <clears throat> By the chair, you'll be asked to give your name and address, and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions are to be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed, <clears throat> the public comment period will be closed. And the, uh, we'll do our best to show any documents that you might need as part of your comments. Uh, so with that, uh, we have one hand raised. Uh, Mr. Loretti. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chris Loretti, can you hear me okay? I can, sir. Can I just have your address for the record? Yes, 56 Adam Street. Thank you. Um, first, Mr. Chair, can I begin with just a procedural um, comment or request? Somebody has turned on the auto transcript feature for this meeting. Oh. And when you use a phone, uh, an Android phone as I am, it covers up a lot of the screen and the plans as you present them. So it makes it both distracting and difficult to see. And well, I don't have any objection to people using that. Is there some way they can turn it off so the participants don't have to look at it? I could not find a setting to do that myself. That is a really interesting question. Um, I, Mr. Uh, Mr. Valorelli, do you, do you, did you or Mr. Um, Mr. Lee enable the transcript? Uh, we did not do it intentionally, but uh, try it now. Is it, is it still going? I still see it. Okay. We're going to try to remove that, Mr. Chairman. All right. I'll do, I just note that. I mean, okay. let's, I don't want to hold up the meeting just because of that. But um, on, on the more substantive issues of this um, application, Mr. Chairman, I, have a, I do have a few comments. I appreciate you bringing up the issue of two front yards. I'm frankly disappointed that the planning department chose not to provide a memo on this particular application, um, but that's water un under the bridge. Um, and I very much appreciate the comments of Mr. Hanlon, because I also um, studied this very carefully, this bylaw change when it came before town meeting, and was frankly someone, someone who was opposed to allowing ADUs in garages. And my recollection about the six feet is exactly the same as his. And it was clearly advertised by the proponents and stated repeatedly that these um, ADUs would, would have to comply with the same setback requirements as, as a home, um, just as if they're, they're a regular house. Um, on this particular one, um, one thing I would note for the people who are more familiar with the building code is I don't see two means of egress for that accessory dwelling unit. And I'm wondering if, if it isn't used to some extent more like just an addition to the home. Um, and indeed, as Mr. Hamlin implied, there's no reason that an ADU cannot be built as part of the existing dwelling unit. So if indeed you had to keep, keep it to one story, you could take away some space of the existing home and then build out more of the second floor for that, for that same home. What it seems to me is really needed here is, is a creative um, architect and not a variance. And, and regarding the variance, I don't see in the application that this comes close to meeting the state requirements for granting a variance. Um, you know, as you know, there's very specific criteria that have to be met, they're very strict, and they're just not there. And, and the neighbors really need to know that because if any of them are opposed, it would be very easy 
to get a variance overturned for this um, for this application as it's given. So, you know, all in all, I think it's it would set a very bad precedence for the board to be granting a variance just because this is an ADU and some people in town very much like ADUs. And it has to be considered just like any other addition. And I, I would suggest that based on what's been presented, you would never get this a variance say if it was just an expansion of a kitchen or a living room. Um, so it really seems to me contrary to public policy for this to receive a variance, um, you know, given, given the facts of the case. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miloretti. Uh, next on our queue is Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Uh, one quick question. Uh, I noticed when I was looking at Google Maps uh, a very large tree in the rear corner, but I'm thinking that's on the neighbor's property. Is that correct, Mr. Chairman? Um, looking at the, let me bring up the photograph uh, that was provided by Mr. Hanlon. Is that this tree in the back corner? Yes, I believe that's, yeah. So that may actually be on, that's either in the neighbor's property or- No, that, that, that is part of our lot. Uh, sorry, I, I think I was not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, my turn. That is not that, Mr. Chair. That is not your lot. His lot, the developer's lot. Uh, I would just ask, uh, ask the Mr. Shaduri if that tree is in his yard or not. It is. It is. It is. But it's beyond where you would be proposed, where the proposed addition would occur. Yes. Yeah. Pardon me. So. So the uh, Mr. Chair, the applicant is going to retain the tree. That's correct. All right. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Stop share on the image. See hand. I see no other hands up for public comment. Um, ah, there we go. Um, uh, next up would be uh, Greg Bartlett. Uh, good evening. My name is Rosemary Kamatsu. Greg Bartlett and I live next door to Ian. Hi, Ian. And Hi. I just want to uh, ask and perhaps even recommend that the question that earlier was asked about how far the, what was the distance between um, the property line, our property line that we share with Ian and the house that rather than refer to Google Maps, that we go rather to the town assessor's office so that the data that we're looking at is consistent. Uh, thank you for that. Okay. Um, was, it, was there anything further? Uh, no, that was it. Thank okay. you. And sorry to interrupt earlier in your meeting. No, not at all. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to address this art, this uh, this hearing? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public comment for this hearing. So this was um, advertised both as a variance and as a special permit, and. So there's a, a variety of different um, questions before the board um, in regards to this application. Let me just go ahead and go back to the final page here. <clears throat> so the questions before the board is, um, I. I think it's fairly clear that in order to approve um, this addition as proposed, we could approve the, the six foot off of the frontage road lot line as a, as a special permit, as a determination that it's not substantially more detrimental. However, the six feet off of the side lot line, because it creates a new nonconformity, that would have that could only be approved um, by the issuance of a variance. 
And as was has been mentioned by members of the board and um, uh, by our by Mr. Loretti, the, there are four specific rules, uh, four specific criteria that need to be met for the issuance of a variance. Um, I'm trying to recall if this application has those within it. The special permit application it does not have the variance application within it. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I wonder whether actually there is a variance application. I mean, this may have been advertised as a variance because uh, ISD understood that, that it may be necessary. Mm -hmm. um, but there's nothing in the record that indicates that the uh, applicant has sought a variance. And more importantly, there's no place in the record that I saw, maybe I'm wrong about this, where the applicant has done his best to make a case for why he should get a variance. So in some ways, I'm a little bit nervous that we really haven't been in a situation where the applicant has had the opportunity uh, uh, to make his case or even to, to consider what, what this all would mean and, and so on. It's, it's coming at him. Uh, uh, I, I just we're sort of worry that we, we sometimes have the situation we're going from an application as it's advertised, and then so with and without an application that that contains the explanation for why the applicant believes he meets the requirements and so forth, is not a procedure that seems very fair to the applicant. And I'm wondering whether, so I'm wondering what what we should be doing about that. I I, I hesitate to go forward with a variance when, with, when we don't really have a record of the variance at this point. We haven't even dis other, we haven't really discussed it uh, except except right now. Right. No, I, I I would like to just review what would be required as the findings in a variance, and then we can ask the the applicant if that's something that you'd be interested in pursuing. Let me quickly try to find. This is the variance criteria. Um, so I went down here. So thus under state law, variance may be granted when all four of the following criteria are met. Uh, first criteria is describe the circumstances relating to the soil conditions, shape or topography, especially affecting such land or structures but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it is located that would substantiate the granting of a variance. Uh, criteria two is to describe how a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaw specifically relating to the circumstances affecting the land or structure noted above would involve a substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner or appellant. Uh, describe how desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and then describe how desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington. Um, and 
the, the state law under chapter 48, section 10 requires that the Zoning Board of Appeals must find that all four criteria are met in order to be authorized to grant a variance. If any one of the standards is not met, met the board must deny the variance. Um, <clears throat> so we just reiterate that because that's, these are the rules that we have to operate under um, if we were to consider a variance. Um, and so I think we would uh, you know, return back to, to the applicant um, Mr. Shadori and sort of ask, you know, I, I think in, as far as a variance is concerned, we're, um, you know, it's a, it's a very, very strict standard. And, you know, personally, I'm not entirely certain. And I think other members of the board have, have expressed it as well, that, um, you may have a difficult time making a case based on, on those four criteria. So I would, so as Mr. Hanlon had asked, um, had you considered applying for a variance or is that not something you were considering? Oh, I, I wasn't aware, uh, okay. to be honest, uh, that there was a, a separate application. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. Um, so at this point, um, I think that we, we have a few different options um, on things we can, we can do. Um, if we wanted to proceed, um, I think the, the, I'm not sure the board can proceed, sorry, with a, with a granting this by a special permit because of the, the new, um, uh, the new nonconformity in the side yard. And therefore it would need to be reviewed as a variance. Um, it has been advertised as a variance. So the board is authorized to go ahead and um, and discuss that, but I think it's something that the um, the applicant is you know was not prepared for, um, and therefore I think possibly a better option um, for the applicant is if. Um, he would be interested in a continuance. So we would um, essentially table your application for now, give you a couple of weeks to sort of consider how you would like to, to proceed. And then you can come back in two weeks and uh, we can sort of discuss it further if you're interested in pursuing a variance um, or if uh, you wanna talk with your designer about see if there's, a, if there's another way to possibly um, alter things so that you can stay out of the side yard setback. Does that, that sound, that's something you'd like to pursue? Absolutely. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, so the next, Mr. Valarelli, what is our next date? Uh, June 14th, Mr. Chairman. June 14th. And as, as it stands now, it's a fairly light night. I think uh, two cases minor in nature. Okay. So then may I have a motion to continue uh, the hearing for 30 Venner Road until Tuesday, June 14 at 7.30 p.m. Chairman, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So Mr. Chairman, before we take a vote on this, if Mr. I could just make one, one comment is that you know, it's been em emphasized that these are very strict criteria, and I, I'm hoping that the that the applicant takes the opportunity over the next couple of weeks of taking very seriously whether he can meet these criteria. Uh, it may be that Mr. Loretti is right, is what he needs is an imaginative architect more than he needs a variance. And uh, so I, I would hope that both things would be on the table. Everybody would sort of like him to be able to solve his problem. Uh, and our hands are tied by the law in a number of ways. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that he'll keep an open mind as he figures out what it is he'd like to do before he comes back to see us again. Thank you, Mr. Van. With that, I'll get a vote of the board uh, on the motion to continue. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Um, Mr. Holly? Aye. And Ms. Hoffman? Aye. 
And the chair votes aye. So we are continued on 30 Venner Road. Thank you so much for coming before us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity again. That brings us back to the agenda. Uh, next item on our agenda is docket number 3688, 44 Edmund Road. Um, I would invite the applicant to introduce himself and tell us what they would like to do. Hi, um, can you hear me all right? We can, thank you. Wonderful, thanks. Um, my name is James Sipar um, from 44 Edmund Road. And uh, what we're hoping to do is build an extension on the back of the house, adding a, um, a bedroom, a family room, and a, a basement section. Uh, and the, the issue is that it's sort of a long, narrow plot um, where we're already in violation, actually, on both sides. On the, um, the left side, we currently have 8.2 feet, and on the right side, 8.9. And uh, um, if we go back, you know, the house is a little bit crooked on the plot. So if we go straight back, we'll, at, we'll go from 8.2 to 8.1 on the left side and 8.9 to 8.1 on the right. Um, one thing that um, I'm hoping is a mitigating factor on the right side is um, to our, immediately to our right is not another, um, another house, but it's actually a right of way a 12 foot right of way and then the next uh, plot that belongs to a house. Um, so while we're, we are in violation um, with that right of way, um, we're, we've got an extra 12 feet before the next actual, um, you know, plot that belongs to a house. Uh, so that's, that's what we're hoping to do. Um, I don't know if that, what other questions you might have? Can I add something? Um, my name is Carl Dumas with Neyland Construction. Are you, the, are you the contractor for this property? I am. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm helping Jim with the addition, and I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, so we're also seeking um, a, a special permit, okay, and and that's for uh, the size of the addition. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually 104 square feet larger than the prescribed by right addition size. Um, and the, uh, currently, the house is 1,380 square feet. It's a Dutch colonial. This is on a very small lot. And like Jim said, it's, it's currently non-conforming lot um, on both the left and the right sides. And we basically have three issues that are creating a hardship on this, on this um, property. And it kind of forces us to plan the addition the way we have uh, and to locate the addition the way we have. Uh, first is the, the shape and size of the lot. Um, and you can see that it's skewed uh, from the street and it also gets narrower as it extends to the rear. So you see the 45 feet in the front and it's 38.8 in the rear. So it's, it's getting narrower, so we're getting squeezed in. The second item is um, the lot at the rear uh, yard has two steep inclines. One is at the rear and one is at the right side. So we're kind of forced to be pretty much tight in the back of the, the lot. And the third, like Jim mentioned, is the fact that we have this 12 foot right away as our neighbor on the right side. Okay. Um, this is um, servicing several houses at the rear of the lots. It's actually servicing houses that are on the parallel street, which is Forest Street behind Edmund Road. Um, now, this right away creates a burden on the lot as a use as a family home. And you can imagine people driving up and down, there's three or four houses that it services. And as much as it being a hardship, it's also a benefit by the fact that you are artificially or seemingly having a larger setback to the next property, which is a house well for beyond that, okay? Um, so in a way, it's trying to help with the 
criteria of, of the bylaw um, and having a more substantial set value. Um, you know, granted, these release, we really do not see any detrimental impact on the neighborhood. In fact, I, we think it improves, you know, with the, the property value of this structure and also it's in keeping with the family oriented neighborhood. Now, wow. we spent quite a bit of time on the application with the four various criteria. And I think that we've met those criteria and then some. And we'd really appreciate your consideration tonight and, and approval. I know that Jim has spoken to some of the neighbors. Um, and I'd like if you could think about that, Jim, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so I spoke to actually the, the neighbors on the right uh, a couple times mo most recently this morning. Um, if they were <laughs> curious about what we were going to do, because uh, they had actually done something similar on their house a while ago when their uh, their son was was younger, um, and that you know they they didn't have a whole lot of questions. I sent them the the plans. Um, so I was, you know. <laughs> encouraging. Um, we spoke to a few other neighbors and there are a few other people in our neighborhood who had also done similar things. If you kind of look around our neighborhood, it's a lot of these sort of small colonials with additions on the back, just like this. So there are a few people who had had, um, had similar experiences. Good, thank you. Um, let's stand from here back to the, this is the, uh, the, so the tabulated information on the page. So, um, is the is the eight hundred fifty four? Is that the size of the addition? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So the combined would be the sum of the thirteen eighty and the eight fifty four. That's right. Um, so as was noted before, um, the, so the, we're not address the front yard's not in question. This is not, everything is at the rear. The left side is going from 8.2 to 8.1. The right side would go from 8.9 also to 8.1. Uh, both of those are pre-existing non-conformities that would be, um, increased, uh, the rear yard depth, um, it doesn't list what the present condition is, but I'm imagining we could calculate that just from the from the plot plan. Um, so the, we're adding by my notes. I think it's fifteen point three to the okay. back. Um, it, like the, the house is not straight across on the back, so it's fifteen point three on one side and nineteen point five on the other. Okay. Yeah, so now it's like 60.7 going down to 45. Um, and then, and there's no questions about the height. Um, so for usable open space, um, so the, the definition of usable open space, it has to be 25, at least 25 feet by 25 feet. Um, and it has to have a minimum, a maximum slope of 8% on 25% of it. Um, and so looking at the grade mark callouts that are on the plan, it's at, you know, it's at 84, it's at 8439, 8474, um, or excuse me, 94, 94, it's 92 on the other side here. Is the retaining wall, is that a retaining wall on the side? Of the it property? is, yes. Okay. And it maintains the, the rear yard is relatively flat to that point? Yes, up until um, the, the, it's probably like three or four feet from the, um, the right of way where it slopes up again. Okay. And, and then it looks, slopes in the back too. Yes. Yeah, it looks like it slopes minimally to the sort of the back left corner and maybe a little bit more towards the back right corner. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's, there's about six to eight feet there in the back. Okay. Yeah, there's a retaining, it's, 
on the thing. There's a retaining wall that goes most of the way across, and then there's like a big chunk of, of rock sitting on the corner of that retaining wall. Ah, OK. So there's a couple things for the board to consider here. One, um, as was noted, one is the it's a, a large addition which uh, has a specific finding and um, an application of the, uh, the the requirements for a special permit. Um, it does appear that the house, it, as it is existing, is compliant with uh, usable open space, and it also appears that. Um, with the proposed addition, it would still comply with the requirements of usable open space, but I think that's a calculation um, that would need to be provided to inspectional services uh, before they could issue a permit. Um, and then the, the final piece is the, the question of the, the side yard setbacks. Um, so this has actually been a, a little bit of a moving target. Um, in town and at the state level over the last couple of years. Um, so under state law, if for single and two family houses, if there's a pre-existing non-conformity as there is on both sides of this house with the, uh, the side yard setback, um, a zoning board of appeals may approve an intensification or an increase in that non-conformity uh, with a determination that it is not more not more detrimental, not more substantially detrimental um, than the current condition. And that is the, it's referred to as a, it's a section six determination and that was affirmed um, in a zoning case at the, uh, at Superior Court. So, um, the board should be under state law, the board is allowed to make this determination. Um, in the town's bylaw, we have an older provision, um, which I will go ahead now and switch over to. Eight one three. 813C, which is the extension of an exterior wall of a single floor two family residential along a line at the same non conforming distance within a required setback, may be allowed, providing the extension creates no new non conformities nor increases any open space non conformities, and that no such extension shall be permitted unless there's a finding by the special permit granting authority that the extension shall not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing non conforming dwelling. Um, so this has been used um, primarily to in town to require a variance for this kind of, uh, so if you are reducing the side yard setback that you would be required to issue a variance, um, which is contrary to what is allowed under state law. And actually at last Wednesday's uh, special town meeting, town meeting voted to strike this section of the zoning bylaw. Um, and as an added quirk under state law, zoning bylaw changes go into effect immediately upon passage. And then if they are not approved by the state attorney general, they are retroactively um, reinserted. So we're in sort of this strange place, but I think we're in a fairly safe place to say that um, the Zoning Board of Appeals is able to, um, to act upon the request for the increased, um, the, the increase in the intensity of the, um, the incursion into the existing non-conforming side yard lines. I believe that the board is well within its rights to act upon that by special permit. Um, and I would just ask Mr. Hanlon if he concurs with that opinion. Chairman, I, if you can hear me, I, I, I uh, turned the video off a moment ago, and now I can't turn it on again. But I, but nevertheless, I, I do completely concur with that. I think that the 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 
guiding with respect to a, the guiding principle with respect to a special permit would be uh, 8.1.3b and under the circumstances the intrusion into the side would count as an extension in the nature of the nonconformity and that is allowed by special permit as long as we make a so-called section six finding uh, that the change will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Um, and, you know, I think that may have been true, even if C continued to exist, but if we, if the town meeting has repealed C as it has, uh, then we're left with 8.1.3B and that's the framework under which we have, uh, under which we can operate. Any other questions specific to that, to that question of our ability to operate as a, under special permit. None. Um, so then going to the board, are there questions or comments for the applicant in regards to, um, to their proposal to uh, provide an addition off the rear of their house, uh, which requires our action under large addition um, and under the uh, increase the um, extension of the existing nonconformity with regards to this two side yard lot lines. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I would just echo what both you and Mr. Hanlon said. And I do think, I, I know you were referring to the Bella Alta case. Yes. I, I think the language in that case is pretty clear that under section six, that we are authorized uh, irrespective of what the bylaw itself says. So I feel that we're on pretty solid ground. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Are there any other questions from the board for the applicant in regards to what they're requesting? Seeing none, I will go ahead and open uh, this hearing for public comment as was stated earlier. Uh, the purpose for public comment is to help inform the board in making its decision. If you would like to uh, speak, if you could raise your hand by uh, selecting the raise hand button um, under the participant tab, or if you are calling in, you can dial star nine. Anyone from the public who wishes to speak to this hearing? Around, I don't see any hands and I don't see anyone waving frantically in their window. Once it's going twice, go ahead and close public comment for this hearing. Um, so that brings us back to, <coughs> excuse me, the question before us. Um, So it, this is a request um, to build an addition uh, in the to the rear of the existing house. It would require, um, I don't know if you would call it two or three special permits, the two or three findings, the first being uh, the large addition and the second and third being uh, the extension of the nonconformity into the left side yard line and the right side lot line. Um, and it has just occurred to me that I have not printed out for myself the form that I usually fill out at this point in the hearing, which includes uh, information on the um, conditions that the zoning board applies. So I beg your pardon.
Standard conditions here we go. All right. Okay. Um, so were the board to approve this application, um, there are three standard conditions that the board would attach. Um, the first reads the plans and specifications approved by the board for this special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There shall be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, condition number two would be the building inspector is hereby notified that he is to monitor the site to proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time he determines that violations are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And the standard condition number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to the special permit grant. Um, I would also uh, propose um, a condition that the applicant is to provide a certified plot plan indicating and dimensioning the areas of the existing and proposed site that comply with the requirements of the usable open space as indicated in section two of the zoning bylaw of the town of Arlington to the inspectional services department for review and approval. Uh, that is just to confirm compliance with that. Are there any other conditions that the board feels would be justified? Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont? So it's not really a condition, but I do note that in the, um, in the advertisement for this particular, the public notice, it indicates that there is also the need and a request for a variance. And there is a variance application attached to that. So before we sort of wrap things up here, I think that we need to dispose of that somehow, whether it's that we put in some language indicating that based upon, you know, the Mass General Laws, uh, you know, section six of uh, chapter 40A that, you know, we've determined that a variance is not necessary or perhaps the applicant withdraws the application for a variance, but I just don't think that we should leave that hanging. What would be the most appropriate action on that. I, I think we could, I think it probably makes most sense to ask the, the applicant to withdraw the request for a variance. Um, that would certainly be the cleanest. Um, and the, the reason for withdrawing it would be that it is not, that it is not necessary at this time. All right. We could do that. Would that be just a request to you formally, or is that part of this meeting? Um, I I would ask um, Mr. Valarelli if he thinks it's fine that we receive that verbally. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it is. Okay. That, 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 that is your call and understood. And we will request that the variance be uh, disposed of. Okay. So we will with will formally withdraw the application for variance. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Yes, Mr. Hanlon. I think the other way to do that is, is since the applicant has just requested that it be withdrawn and it's been noticed already that we should just uh, move to accept the withdrawal and then that will dispose of it without prejudice. And then we uh, can get to the main business of doing the special permit. So I have a motion to accept the withdrawal of the variance application. 
for 44 Edmund Road. So I so move. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. The vote of the board in regards to the motion to with, uh, accept the withdrawal of the variance application for 44 Edmund Road. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. And the chair votes aye. So that variant, we accept that variance has been withdrawn. Um, which brings us back to the special permit application. So the board, um, go back to their application. Um, just gonna bring up quickly the doc, the memo from Department of Planning and Community Development. They review the special permit criteria. Um, the criteria one on requested use. Uh, so the requested use is permitted through a special permit. Um, the, the use itself is, is an allowed use, um, but we can grant this through the uh, special permit in the R1 zoning district. Um, so let me grab, I think our form is a little easier to follow. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Just to, <clears throat> there, we're proceeding under really two basic, two different provisions of the zoning bylaw, one of which is uh, section 8.1.3b and the other of which is the provision on large additions. And they're a little bit different, um, uh, but those are the two uh, provisions of the zoning bylaw that authorize us to grant a special permit. Okay. So the first is the large additions, and the second is eight one three B. Large additions is large additions. What is it? Uh, for sub six B six under yeah, five four two B six. So into where the requested use is listed in the table of use regulations. So as Mr. Hanley pointed out, there's for large additions is 542B6. And for the um, the non-conforming, uh, the existing non-conformity in a single and double family is under 813B. Um, explain why the requested use is essential or desirable to the public convenience or welfare. Um, the applicant has proposed that the proposed Addition creates more living area for growing long-term Arlington family. It will allow the family to stay in their home while also giving them the space they need. Criteria number three, explain why the requested use will not create undue traffic congestion or unduly impair pedestrian safety. Proposed additions of rear side of the property and the addition will not increase the number of inhabitants living on the property. Therefore, the proposed design will not create undue traffic, nor will it impair pedestrian safety. Um, oops. The fourth criteria explain why the requested use will not overload any public water drainage or sewer systems or any other municipal systems to such an extent that the requested use or any developed use in the immediate area or any other area of town will be unduly subject to the hazards affecting the health, safety, and general welfare. Number of inhabitants will not change due to the addition, simply expanding to create more living space for the current family. Therefore, the addition will not overload public water drainage or any other municipal system. Uh, criteria five, uh, describe how special regulations for the use as may be provided in the zoning bylaw, including but not limited the provisions of section eight are fulfilled. The home is non-conforming in nature due to the size, shape, et cetera. 
the proposed addition does not increase the number of inhabitants, nor does it impair the integrity or character of the neighborhood or district. Um, and there's also a special uh, provision, uh, as Mr. Hanlon had noted, under um, large the provisions for large addition, which requires um, making its determination the Board of Appeals shall, uh, where is this age? The Board of Appeals finds the alteration or addition is in harmony with other structures and uses in the vicinity. Uh, and so this is a residential neighborhood. This home is in the middle of the residential neighborhood and the addition um, just increases the living space in an, addition, in an existing uh, single family house um, in keeping with the, uh, the, sort of the, the current architecture of the, of the house. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Just to, I, to elaborate on that a little bit, the, the addition is made in the rear so that it doesn't have an adverse effect on the frontage, which is, which is actually consistent with the residential design guidelines. The testimony that we've had in the hearing indicates that similar additions have occurred in the back on a number of the other houses in, in the neighborhood, and that too means that the way in which this is proceeding is more or less in harmony with, uh, with everything else. Um, the, one of the potential problems that the large additions are attempting to get at is avoiding situations where uh, you're too close to the lot line and, and you're, you're uh, uh, overwhelming the neighboring properties here. Uh, that clearly isn't happening in the back and the, and the de minimis amount of additional approaching on either side is, is, is essentially trivial. And on the one side, you've got the right of way so that that makes it uh, even less uh, of an encroachment on neighboring properties. And all of those factors, it seems to me, go together to uh, help establish why it is that this is in, in harmony with the neighborhood and with the, just, and with the adjacent drones. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, and then also under that under that same um, criteria, under the, the finding that the board needs to make under 813 on the non-conforming single family or two family dwellings, um, the board needs to make a determination that it will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. And in this, for the, the reasons very much as to why this is in harmony, um, as stated by Mr. Hanlon, go directly towards why this is not more detrimental to the neighborhood. And then returning to the criteria, oops. Um, <clears throat> the sixth, explain why the requested use will not impair the integrity or character of the district or adjoining districts, nor be detrimental to the health and welfare. Um, the applicant has put forth that the district is primarily residential homes. The proposed addition allows for the family to grow and stay in their home, keeping the property from being bought by developers or rental agencies, thus keeping the district family oriented and not impairing the integrity or character of the district or districts. And as Mr. Handel had put forward um, under the previous section, um, that, that maintains the house being in harmony with the neighborhood. And uh, or the last criteria, explain why the requested use will not by its addition to the neighborhood cause an excess of the use that could be detrimental to the character of the neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood is primarily single family homes. The addition allows a long-term Arlington family to stay in its home while creating more living area for the family to grow, thus keeping the neighborhood and family oriented, therefore maintaining the character of the neighborhood. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. I'd like to go back to uh, paragraph E. The special regulations is something that we routinely sort of just go right by. Uh, most of the reports from the planning department indicate that no special regulations are required. I just wanted to make the point that this language comes from before the, at least the language in the bylaw comes from before the uh, recodification in 2018. At that point, the provision that included the affordable housing provision, the inclusionary zoning, and the uh, provisions for non-conforming use were all in a section that was labeled special regulations. Uh, and I believe that the special regulations that are being referred to 
are the things that we that were referred to previously and then uh, this was not this was a provision that wasn't changed during the re recodification so just i mean this is perfectly sensible the way the applicant has put it in but i just wanted to draw the attention to, of the board to the fact that we we're not reserving we don't have the right to just create special regulations the issue really in in almost all these cases uh where we have a non-conforming use is whether section whether what is now section eight uh is uh is uh, complied with and and here the finding would be that it is thank you mr hamlin are there any further comments or questions from the board seeing none the chair will entertain the motion mr chairman um, I move that the board uh, approve the special permit uh, for the large addition and for the uh, uh, extension of the uh, non-conforming use subject to the uh, conditions that the chair has previously read into the record. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. <clears throat> So this is a vote of the Board of uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals to approve the special permit application for 44 Edmund Road with the four conditions that were previously read into the record. Uh, so vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. And the chair votes aye. That is a unanimous vote to approve the special permit for 44 Edmund Road. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good night. You're welcome. That going back to our <clears throat> agenda, item number twelve in the docket on the agenda, docket number three six nine eight, which is thirty nine Tufts Street. So I invite the applicant to introduce themselves and. Tell us what they would like to do. Good evening. My name is Carl Shanley. Um, we're looking to renovate uh, 39 Tuff Street, um, basically bringing the house back up to code. Uh, the current owners have owned it since 1980, and their son is um, intending of moving back in and using the second and third floor for its own residence and then still keeping the first floor as rental. Um, that's kind of the gist of it. It's all going back onto the same frame that is originally there. The only thing that we added would be the dormers on the roof that would uh, more make more living space uh, on the third floor. Thank you. I will go ahead and bring up the application document. So this is the site plan. Uh, so the existing house and um, Mr. Shanley, I believe you, you said that you're staying entirely within the existing footprint? Correct. So there is an existing backyard, which qualifies for a usable open space. Mm -hmm. um, the driveway down the side and the existing garage. Yes. So the basement, um, so the increase in the area of the basement, is that just a change in the use of an area? It, of the it's actually a change in the back porch accessibility. Uh, we are not uh, aware of what's under there for a foundation. Um, but yes, I would assume just by that change is probably making the difference. Okay. And then the additional space in the attic area and the... Um, and the 637 is less than 50% of the 1279, which is the area of the floor below. Right. Certified plot plan. Um, and I believe the plans that we receive is just the proposed plans. Had you prepared a, a set of existing plans at all? We had. 
Um, and you're looking at an older schematic. Ah, so okay. We, I can share my desktop. We provided back in January mm -hmm. um, a permit set of drawings. And then I think they asked for existing conditions at that point, And we submitted those back in February. Uh, oh. They don't seem to be included in this package. Um, but I, I could show you, take you through them if I could share my desktop. Valerelli, can you give Mr. Harley the permission to do so? I can do that. Okay, Mr. Holly, you should be good to go. Mr. Hanlon? Uh, I was just going to ask Mr. Valarelli if, if, if the plans that we're about to see are already in the record as he knows it, since if not, we should, we should get a copy of them for the record. Uh, Mr. Hanlon, that is, what, we, what is on Novus is all that were received by uh, special services. Um, we did the numbers based on the proposed uh, the plans that we have and everything checked out with the, uh, the exception of the open space. It was already pre-existing non-conforming at 22%. Uh, and with the additional GFA, it's going to be 20%. Okay. Uh, so to answer your question, no, I'm about probably about to see the uh, existing for the first time. Okay, so if I could make the request that the applicant uh, pro you know, provide I don't want to get into whether or not it was already provided and so forth. That the applicant could just provide a copy of the existing so that we have them for the record. Uh, that would be uh, that would be beneficial. Okay, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so um, here's the existing first floor. Where you come into a, 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 okay. I don't do this a lot. So is everyone seeing the first floor, existing first floor plan? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So yeah, you come in uh, from the existing stoop into uh, the entry um, up up a stair to the second floor, uh, second, third floor unit. This is the entry for the first floor unit. And then there's entries off the back in the existing sunroom, uh, which you can access the first floor unit and then up into the second. Uh, currently, there's um, there's a little bit of, there's really no place once you're in your own unit to take off your shoes, uh, hang up your winter coats and those kind of things. And um, we were looking for ways to improve this um, for the owners. Um, the second floor, um, you arrive from that existing sunroom up uh, into the existing kitchen. Uh, this is the stair down up into what's a little entry and then the stair on up to the third floor. There's an existing bedroom there now that's very um, low and tight and into um, a sort of double closet and then to an existing uh, bathroom. So all these features are that we're working on are, are, are there now. We're just uh, expanding them. Um, on the proposed, what um, we're looking for is is uh, separate entries, so that you come in in the first floor unit, you have a, a closet, um, and in the back you have a, um, which is generally where uh, the majority of it coming in. You'll have a little mud room, a place to take off your shoes, hang coats, and a closet. And then the, the same two bedrooms, renovated bath and a new kitchen. Um, the second and third floor units will have a new entry with a coat closet. Again, a little mud room uh, up the existing stair into the living space on the second floor. The same two bedrooms, new kitchen. Um, in the back, um, a mud room at the top of the stairs and a laundry. And then on the third floor, oops, yeah, up a stair, a, sm uh, a small, sitting area into the mat you know, what, what we're calling master bedroom a dormer out facing the street and then a dormer to uh, get a little bit of light in the master bath um, a walk-in closet the um there seemed to be a little bit confusing i think confusion from the planning board the um there's attic over all of this space and the 600 and i think it was 37 square feet is above seven and there's 600 i think it's 40 uh, below seven feet so that we met the uh, criteria for the half story rule. And the the seven foot is taken from the the, fin the top of the finished floor to the underside of the roof structure? Up to the rafters, yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the um, 
the elevations. So the, um, the living spaces sort of stack up. We um, align that dormer into the third floor with those spaces. There's a, a small roof um, kind of for scale. And when you're coming in the front door, so you have a little bit of coverage. Um, this is the existing, there's an existing summer room that we're proposing to, uh, to rebuild. And this will provide the, you know, the rear entries for uh, both units. I would just on this elevation here, just mm -hmm. to, um, to note for the record. So the only differences that I see between the submitted elevations, the elevations that are presented here um, on the north elevation, that's sort of on the first floor, the third set of double windows to the um, from the, the that was counting from the left. Um, that was shown as a single window in the prior plan, and that's now being shown as a double. It's just that that third set of windows over. Um, and on the south elevation, um, in the upper level, um, the double window is the same, and then the individual window, uh, the smaller one, is shown uh, is is slightly more to the left now. Uh, so now it sort of appears to be sort of centered on the gap between the two windows below before it was sort of in line with the left edge of, of those two windows below. And then also the, the roof shape is slightly different. The original, it was a gable roof. Um, and here it's a gambrel roof. So it has the, the extra little, little hitch in the roof. And then the front and the rear elevations looked essentially identical with the exception of the, the additional ridge line because of the gambrel. And then do you have existing exterior elevations? Uh, no, just the plans. Yeah. And I, ha I do have photos. Right. Um, we have photos to back up. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, the tough street side, with the, the little garrison it goes over and there's a, a crossing gable. And mm -hmm. in the rear, this is that existing sunroom. And it, it appears to be a frost wall on a slab below this. And uh, what we're proposing on, on that is the, the basement stair, the existing basement stair is very steep and what we'd like to do is in this entryway, get you a little bit better stair down. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll be, you know, re the proposal is to re-pour that foundation and create um, the space to bring that down. Oh, okay. And so the, at the basement level, then that the sunroom will connect to the exist the, the, rest, the rest of the basement? That's correct. Okay. Other questions or comments from the board? Oh, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon? As I understand this, and I'm a little bit unclear as to what was just said about the uh, implications of what's going on with the sunroom, uh, but it's, it's fair to say that the uh, uh, that, that after the alteration uh, of, of, of this, uh, this structure, uh, everything is going to be completely within the existing foundation walls? Correct. That's, That's correct. correct. Uh, so just for the the record in general, there was a question raised because this is a two family house in a single, in an R1 district. And there was a question as to whether this was, um, sort of how that came about and what the providence of that was. Um, and uh, the uh, building inspector, Mike Champa was good enough to provide me with a copy of the original building permit from June 16th, 1938. That clearly indicates it's a dwelling for two families. So it was originally built 
as a two family house. So it's an existing non conforming use that's not being, uh, not being altered. Zoning by lots. And the, where this is an ex, so I guess this is the question uh, for the board. So where this is a two-family house in a single-family district, the use is technically. Do we think that the use is technically non-conforming? Are you saying eggshells? And the reason I bring that up is so there are several sections of the zoning bylaw that deal that deal with non-conformities of um, of the lot and of the building of the structure, um, but the section that deals with section eight one two is the section that deals with non-conforming uses. Um, Uh, which reads so unless the board of appeals has made the the finding provided for in general law 48 section six which is the determination of that it's not more substantially more detrimental and section 811 um then we to the in order for the non-conforming principal use of the structure to be extended the board needs to find that um it's not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood, the extension. Um, and then 811, it's the applicability section. I apologize, I need to just refresh for myself. Uh, so it reads, except as provided in the section, the bylaw shall not apply to structures or use is lawfully in existence or lawfully begun or to a building permit or a special permit issued before the first publication of notice of the public hearing on this bylaw, which is December 14th, 2017. However, this bylaw shall apply to any change or substantial extension of such use or to a building permit or a special permit issued after the first notice of said public hearing or to any reconstruction extension or structural change of any structure and to any alteration of the structure begun after the first notice of said public hearing to provide for its use in a substantially different purpose or for the same purpose in a substantially different manner or to a substantially greater extent, except where alteration, reconstruction, extension, or a structural change to a single family or two family residential structure does not increase the non-conforming nature of said structure. Pre-existing non-conforming structures or uses may be extended or altered provided that no such extension or alteration shall be permitted Unless there's a finding by the Board of Appeals that such change, extension, or alteration shall not be more substantially detrimental to the existing nonconforming structure or use in, to the neighborhood. It is the purpose of this bylaw to discourage in perpetuity, excuse me, discourage the perpetuity of nonconforming uses and structures whenever possible. So, in order to um, approve the extension of the existing nonconforming use, the Board just needs to make a determination uh, that it is not substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. Are there any further questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, I will go ahead and open um, this hearing for public comment. Uh, public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand and is to be used to help inform the board and decision. 
Um, if you would like to speak to this hearing, if you could uh, use the raise hand feature in Zoom under the participants tab, or um, if you're calling in, uh, you may dial star nine. So with that, um, the first on the speakers list is Mr. Loretti. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street again. Can you hear me? I we can, sir. Thank you. And thank you for um, getting the original building permit posted demonstrating that it is indeed a uh, um, prior non-conforming, pre-existing non-conforming use. Um, but this is a one family district outside of Tusk Street. And I believe um, with perhaps one exception, this is the only two family home on that, on that side of the street. Um, and you know, I think there's a, a couple things the board needs to consider in just the size of this structure, particularly with the addition in comparison to all the other homes, um, all but one of which I think are single family homes, because it really is substantially larger. And I think um, Mr. Valarelli mentioned that it is increasing the nonconformity with respect to usable open space. And there's also another um, dimensional um, nonconformity that it's increasing. Because it's a two family and a one family district, this, um, this structure has, I believe, an FAR limit of 0 0.35. The existing structure doesn't come close to meeting that. And that's only gonna get worse with the, with the addition. Um, so what my understanding is, and this has happened on, on my street of two families, and it's happened on the next street over on Foster Street with two families, is um, in order to prevent the increase of the open space nonconformities, the developer has been required to remove the garage. And I believe that's an appropriate um, remedy in this case as well, in order to prevent the, um, um, you know, the increase in the uh, usable open space nonconformity. And, and to alleviate, um, well, I guess it doesn't really alleviate at all the, um, the FAR requirement, but, but I think it does make it more consistent with the single family homes in the neighborhood in regard to the massing of the structure with the size of the undersized lots. And, and these, all, these are all, I believe, undersized lots. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other members of the public who wish to, to speak to this question? I believe Mr. Mr. Harley, did you want to speak to the? the yes, the I'm sorry. I was having trouble finding the um, raise my hand feature. I did want to say also across the street, there's a, um, a very large three story school that's a part of this neighborhood as well. Uh, this directly across the street. Uh, so it's not, um, anyway, it's. Um, um, in terms of, I, th I think, scale in the neighborhood, it's uh, it's very close and, again, much smaller than the building directly in front of it. Um, that's all I was going to add. Oh, thank you. Any further members of the public who wish to speak to this hearing? Um, Mr. Barrett? Uh, yeah, hi, how you doing? Um, it's Rob Barrett. Okay. Uh, I guess technically uh, 41 Foster Street. I'm the new uh, director of facilities for the town of Arlington, ah, uh, kind of representing okay. the Gibbs School. Uh, so uh, really comments I, it may probably not affecting denial or approval. I just wanted to, uh, you know, verify traffic, uh, noise, um, dust, stuff like that, control uh, during the construction if this is approved. And uh, what the question is on timing, what, what, when do you believe the... Um, construction will occur. The majority of the construction is, is deemed to start sometime this summer between, I think the tenants are meant to move out between the 31st and the end of June. And the majority of the deconstruction and reconstruction should be done before the school term starts back up again. And then everything that is will then be restricted to parking in the parking lot. There is quite a lot of parking in that um, driveway probably six, at least six trucks. And we feel that that should be ample enough for the people that are on site at that time. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public comment for this 
hearing. Um, I did want to just go back and just confirm what Mr. Um, what Mr. Loretti brought forward uh, in the R0 and R1 districts. Um, the, there is no FAR for a single family detached dwelling, but for an, a quote, other permitted structure, uh, there is a maximum FAR of 0 0.35, um, which I believe would apply to, um, to this property. Um, going back to the application, um, don't believe that it doesn't look like the FAR was calculated. Um, but we can take a quick pass at that. So the existing um, gross square footage is 3716 and the proposed is 4234. Um, So the proposed would be 0 0.847. And the existing is 0 0.743. And then for usable open space, um, the present condition, uh, let me actually just go ahead and share this here. So it's an existing undersized lot, the frontage is on. It's undersized. Uh, FAR, as we just discussed, the current condition is 0 0.743, and the proposed condition is 0 0.847. Um, the lot coverage is unchanged. Uh, lot area per dwelling unit doesn't change. They're not changing any of the setbacks. The height and stories. Uh, so the present condition is slightly under 2.5 probably around 2.25 or 2.2, going up to 2.5. Um, is the, the height is changing slightly because they are replacing the roof, that's correct. Um, and then the landscaping as a percentage, it's greater than 10%. And then the usable open space at the rear of the property, um, as we mentioned before, it has to be at least 25 feet by 25 feet in order to qualify. So this, uh, property currently has um, 835 square feet of usable open space that is unchanged. And the percentage um, current condition is 22%. And it is being proposed to be reduced to 20% where the minimum is 30. So that is um, an increase, it's a requested increase in the existing nonconformity. Parking spaces, parking area setback, loading, type of construction, uh, and the slope of the roof. So at present, it appears that um, there's several different issues going on here. So one is a non-conforming use extension. which under section 8.2, let's confirm that. Eight point one point two. Yeah, it's under 8.1.2. Um, the non-conforming principal use of the structure can be extended with a finding by the board that it is not substantially more detrimental. Um, and then the second is the, it's the 
um, extension of existing nonconformity with usable open space. Extension of existing nonconformity. In regards to uh, the FAR, um, I believe it is just those elements. Was there anyone aware of any other nonconformities that were present? Chair, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. So, um, I, so we're dealing with a, a non-conforming structure in terms of the proposal, correct? Mm -hmm. In terms of the um, the usable open space. So that's the structural element, and then there's the continuation or the extension of the use, non-conforming use. So, do I have that right? Is that what you were? So there's two. Yes, yeah, so there's two non-conformities in regards to this to the structure. One has to do with um, with the usable open space that is currently only provides 22% relative to um, the gross floor area. And then the expansion of the house decreases that to 20% when the minimum is supposed to be 30. And then the second is that um, the existing FAR for a non-conforming use structure in the district um, is supposed to be 0 0.35 and it's currently um, at 0 0.743 and it's proposed to be increased to 0 0.847. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, so I'm not, I'm One not of the hearing things you. I'm sorry. Um, bear with me a minute while I get the machinery up. Oh, I, I can hear that. Okay, well, let me see if I can do without <laughs> the machinery. Um, on section, section 8.1.3a, provides that alteration, reconstruction, extension, or structural change to a single or two family residential structure, which this is, mm -hmm. that is completely within the existing foundation walls does not increase the non-conforming nature of such structure. And while I, so there are two ways of, it's not, it seems to me that that addresses directly the situation where an increase in the floor space of the, of the structure is going to tip off things that uh, are essentially based on that. So the usable, the FAR and the, uh, it seems to me at least that the FAR and the usable open space requirements uh, ought to be covered, all other things being equal uh, by 8.1.3 and I, A, and I've been wondering why it is that we have the jurisdiction to find that there's an extension of the, an increase of the non-conforming nature of such structure uh, at all. Now, it may be that the fact that this is a non-conforming use uh, means that an increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure, which of course this isn't under section A, might be treated differently because the use itself is a non-conforming use. Um, but I'm wondering what I mean, this is all sort of, as it's not too unusual with the non-conforming uses, there are various provisions that are all sort of coming together in an odd way. Uh, and I'm not 100% sure that we're in a position to make a section six finding of no detrimental impact uh, because we are precluded by uh, 1.1.3a from finding that there's an increase in the non-conforming nature of the structure. So it's a it's a little bit of a puzzle. If this were if this were if if the extension if this were a one family 
and there was not a non-conforming use, what would it, what would it be? It seems to me that uh, subsection A would apply. And the question in my mind is whether it makes a difference that uh, it's a non it's a two non-conforming two family uh, use. Very interesting question. Um, certainly, my sense is that. Um, let me go ahead and just display the text of eight one three here. So this is 813A that, uh, that Mr. Hanlon has just been explaining. Um, so I think it could be taken to imply that 813A would basically cover the question of usable open space and the question of FAR. Um, but it, I don't think it would cover the question of the the extension of the non-conforming use. But that can be that can be um, allowed with the with the section six finding. Right. I'm not 100 sure, Mr. Chairman. I mean, ordinarily, when you're talking about the extension of an unsuccess, you're, you're talking about a mom and pop coffee shop turning into the kickstand or something, mm -hmm. not, which is wonderful, but uh, you're not talking, it does seem to me odd that the only extension of the non-conforming use here, the use is pretty much the same as it's always been. It's only that the structure is increased that we're treating it as an extension of the use. And I'm wondering whether the concept of extending the use is broad enough to include something that isn't, is entirely a, a matter of, of increasing uh, increasing the structure. It's, it's an odd sort of thing because if you have a little store and you make a really big store out of it, that in some ways it changes the use because the way in which the store operates is different depending upon whether it's a farmer's market stall or whether it's uh, Wegmans. But uh, I'm not sure that what's, that the kind of change that we're envisioning here is one that involves any significant extension of the use. It's just two family, it's still two family, and more or less on the same scale it always was. Right. So the, 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 the wording of eight one two specifically that unless the Board of Appeals has made the section six finding, any non-conforming principal use of a structure shall not be extended. Uh, and then this I would take extended in this meaning to meaning that it would be extended into an addition, but I guess it could also be, is there another way to, to consider what the term extended might mean in this context? Because here it says, if you, Mr. Chairman, any non-conforming principal use of the structure shall not be extended. And here it's not really the use of the structure that's being extended, it's the structure itself that's being extended and that's what 8.1.38 is supposed to address. Yeah. Yeah, this section B has always been a little odd because the second part of it which deals with the change to another non-conforming use. Deals at odds with the first sentence. Of course, this is a very general provision that's supposed to apply to all kinds of non-conforming uses, whereas the provision in 8.1.3b uh, is focused and was intended to provide a more lenient treatment for single family or two family right. dwellings. And so it, I'm a little nervous about taking what seems to be a favorable treatment for single family or two family dwellings in 8.1.3 and sort of taking away from that based on 
8.1.2, which, which is, is much broader than that. Mm -hmm. How do other members of the board feel on this point? I guess we could make a finding that in regards to um, the extension of the non-conforming use. And then we at least have that on the record in case that there's a question that comes up later in that regard, which would then just leave us with 813A as the justification for why, um, because everything is within the existing foundation wall, it's not increasing the non-conforming nature of the structure. So if the non-conforming structure is not becoming more non-conforming, then I think Mr. Hanlon's point about the usable open space and the FAR numbers both being covered under that provision makes sense. Mr. Chairman, Hanlon. it's conceivable that I mean, I've just been thinking about how to write this up in a way that avoids, you know, delay while we work with town council and try to resolve this. Uh, it, it would, we could grant the, our ability to grant the permit is based upon the notion that there's an extension of the non, of the nature of the non-conforming use. That's the term of art that we use. Mm -hmm. uh, we could simply raise the question is that, that it's, it's doubtful that there is an extension of the non-conforming use because of 8.1.3a, but the applicant has sought a, a special permit and we're prepared to, on the assumption that there is an extension of the nature of the non-conforming use, assuming that we are interested in granting the permit, that we could say we're, we're also prepared to make the section six finding, the no detriment finding, mm -hmm. um, and then there you are. Um, and then we, then, you know, it, it, it is what it, it is what it is. Nobody is going to complain that we've issued a special permit that we didn't necessarily need to issue depending upon what the conditions are. I suspect somebody might complain if we sought to eliminate, eliminate the garage. I think that would be sufficient. Yeah. I will say when we get, I mean, in a moment we, we get to, I think the point that Mr. already made, this is close to my house. I walk by this all the time. It really is true that, that if you, that the street and as is true also of Bates Street to some extent, um, is really looks one, is, is it's not, the, 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 most of the buildings are not built up to the, they're, they're short. There are two stories, uh, and this will, I think, uh, with the suggestions that have been made, look quite, quite different from the prevailing trend of of the of the street. So I wouldn't necessarily assume. Uh, well, I don't know that it'd be non detrimental, and I leave that up to the architects in in some ways. Uh, but it's it's. It's not entirely clear. There is there is a difference in scale that you guys might want to take into consideration. Certainly, running along Tuff Street, there are a lot of those sort of garrison style houses with you know the the two the two stories where the upper story extends over the first story by a foot towards the street and capped in a, uh, in a gable roof that's where the ridge is parallel to the street. So there are many of those. Granted, this house is, um, the house immediately to the left is only a single story house, uh, which sort of exacerbates the height that it appears, but sort of looking up and down the street, it's not abundantly clear that as it's built, it's 
taller than the others and the addition portion is really off the rear. Um, but yes, the, the, the proposed alteration where they're gonna change the roof shape um, and make it, would make it slightly taller would change the appearance. But I recall from driving over there last, last weekend, it didn't strike me as being significantly out of scale with the rest of the, with the rest of the houses. Mr. Chairman, um, I also, I, you know, I, I live in the neighborhood as well, and I walk like down the street some days, um, and you, you know, I think uh, it's sort of a unique street. Um, there's this typology that's similar to the house um, that we're looking at here, uh, but there's also a couple of triple deckers, which are very unique to Arlington across the street, and then uh, the school. Uh, it's sort of a, uh, the neighborhood doesn't have one consistent language, I would say, uh, as much as some of the other neighborhoods in, in East Arlington do. Um, my, my personal thought is that uh, as the, the main structure of the house isn't changing, that it would not be more detrimental, uh, even with the addition of the dormer on the, on the front roof, um, just looking at kind of the, the context around it. Thank you. And so looking at a, a higher a higher view, um, you know, 39, that same sort of shape and layout appears two houses down uh, on the corner with Raleigh Street. And then on the opposite side of Raleigh Street, again, is that same, uh, what appears to be another identical house. There are several instances of that on the street. And then the proposed expansion, granted it's going to, the sort of the sides will be become much more prominent. Um, because what's, Yeah, because basically the right now the way the gable is set up on the side it's about 50 percent of the length of the house and the proposal is to change it to be the full length of the house so it will be a different appearance from the way it is now and from those other houses that are similar So if the board were to approve this project, um, I think we would have our standard three conditions um, to, uh, to Mr. Barron's point about the construction directly across from uh, the Gibbs School. Are there any conditions in relation to uh, to that that we we would want to consider. It did sound from the um, from the testimony of the contractor that their intention is to have most of the um, the major construction done prior to Labor Day, which would make which would help to uh, keep this from. Uh, impacting the school itself. Correct. And, it, um, and did, had, you, had you said that there was uh, sufficient parking offsite on the property for? There's a, we, we estimate that somewhere between five and six vehicles could park off, seat, off street most of the day, as well as we're gonna have accessibility to the garage. Obviously the house will be completely vacant. So the garage will obviously be usable for storage of new and whatever other stuff needs to go on site. So okay. we're trying to keep everything to the back of the property. Obviously, children's safety is precedent. You know, we hope to have a envelope before 
you know, weather turns so that we can be working inside and so forth. The main objective is to get it buttoned up and clean and then do the inside stuff then after that. Okay. Um, does anyone know which side of the building has the student pick up and drop off? Is it on both sides or on one side or the other? We believe it's Tough Street because of the one-way access. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, the uh, sorry, the, the parking. Sorry? You know, yeah, hello. <laughs> the uh, parking is directly across, almost almost directly across from uh, from 39. So, uh, there, you know, there would be probably teachers, maybe parents coming in out of that out of that parking lot. So there there would be a concern for traffic. And then the only other concern, even even during non-student months or when school's out, mm -hmm. um, dust control would be a concern. I think most of that's. Uh, inside at that point anyway but uh there are air handling units uh directly across from this property yep. uh, and so we would be concerned with the air handling units of the school uh, i know a lot of contractors think they're not making a lot of dust but um it doesn't take much to clog up the filters so we would just be concerned with dust control okay absolutely we'd probably end up trying to keep the roof on the house and keep the envelope the way it is while the interior's got it and then move on to the roof and the outside structure at that time. Hopefully that would do it. Anyone from the board who'd want to propose a condition based on these concerns? Um, I wonder, I mean, this is the sort of thing that Mr. Barrett needs to be sort of involved in. I sort of detect the back and forth that as Mr. Barrett raises a point, uh, Mr. Harley or Mr. Shanley have an idea as to how it might be done. I don't think we're in a position to just prescribe how everything is to be done. And, and I wonder if of a condition to the general effect that that the applicant will consult with the uh, will discuss with the, with the school division uh, ways of addressing these problems and then and leave it up to them to to work it out might be a, a, a better way to uh, receive uh, otherwise it seems to me that we'd have to ask mr Barron to work together with mr harley and mr shanley who present to us the conditions that are necessary in order to to govern this, since I don't really think that we're in a position just to make them up on the spot. Absolutely. Communication is easy. We can exchange phone numbers and be in contact when things are happening, so he's aware of them, so he's not hearing about them third party. So maybe the condition that we, that just says that, 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 the applicant will consult with with representatives of the school district to address uh, to address parking uh, 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 dust control uh, and other issues. Mr. Barrett might be able to help me finish out that list uh, in a mutually satisfactory way, and then 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 expect the process to work. Oh uh, yeah, I'm fine with. Uh being in communication with the with the construction team on site there. Um, I'd have to see if there's, there may be summer programs there as well. Uh, I'd have to verify that too. But as long as I had a contact there, if, um, you know, if I, I highly doubt that, you know, it would be much effect on the school. But if there is an effect on the school, I'd like to be able to um, come up with a, a, you know, maybe stop work and a solution to, to continue. Absolutely. So the applicant will coordinate with the school department to discuss issues of dust control, noise, and traffic as they relate to the Gibbs School. Is that no sure. problem? There? Okay. So that would be a proposed condition number four. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns from the board? Seeing none, I would ask for a motion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. 
Um, I move that the board uh, uh, approve the application for a special permit subject to the four conditions that the chair has just read into the record. Thank you, so just to step back, the three standard conditions that were read into the record before and the fourth condition that uh, was read into the record just now. Thank you, Mr. Hannon. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this would be a vote of the Zoning Board of Appeals to approve a special permit for 39 Tuff Street um, with the four, the four stated conditions, the three standard and the one additional. Um, before we take that vote though, um, I just wanna make sure that we are all um, in agreement with the finding that um, uh, that the, that the extension of the proposed, as Mr. Hanlon has stated before, um, it's, it's very possible that we do not need to have a, a finding that the extension of the use is uh, not more detrimental, but on the possibility that that is actually a required finding uh, based on the, the, the uh, zoning bylaw, I think it's important that the board go on the record um, as to whether they whether they approve of that as well. Um, so are there are there I guess I, are, is there anyone on the board who feels that um, the extension of the two family use into the, the larger confines as the house is proposed would be more detrimental to the neighborhood? So seeing none. Okay. I just wanted to make sure we had that on the record. Thank you. Um, so then the motion before us is to approve a special permit for 39 Tuff Street with uh, the four conditions. Um, it has been moved, it has been seconded. So uh, are there any further questions? Vote of the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanley. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Rickard Alley. Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are approved on that special permit. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for your all. time. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Cheers. Back to our agenda. This brings up docket number 3696, 82 Grandview Road. Um, as we um, had noted before, there has been a request to continue this hearing. Um, I do see that there is a member of the public who has a hand raised. I'll go ahead um, and uh, ask them to speak. Um, Hi, this is Holly McLaughlin. Just a quick question on the 82 Granby Road request. Yeah. If the owner does intend to proceed at a future date with that request, will we receive additional notification through the mail? And at what point? So there will, there will not be a separate mailing, um, but we will be, so the, the vote that the board is gonna take, we have to continue to a specific date so we will be, um, so the vote that will be proposed uh, will be to continue to Tuesday, June 14th. So that, okay. that is the date they would be returning. Okay, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, as noted, uh, the applicant has uh, sent a letter to uh, Mr. Valarelli requesting a continuance. Um, They're trying to work out uh, some details of their proposal uh, with uh, an abutting neighbor. And so while they're working on that, they have requested a continuance. Um, so I would accept a motion to continue the special permit uh, hearing for 82 Grandview Road until Tuesday, June 14th at 7.30 p.m. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. I have second. A second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. So this is a vote of the Zoning Board of Appeals to continue this, the special permit hearing on 82 Grandview Road until Tuesday, June 14th at 7.30 p.m. Um, any further questions on the board? No. Being none. Chairman, yes, sir. I, it just, it, I, I think it should be clear that, I'm not sure that this would apply in this case, but uh, by, by accepting the request of the applicant, 
for a continuance, I assume that it's understood between the applicant and the board that the statutory time for the board to act would be equivalently extended. That is well taken. Mr. Chairman, if I may, Rick Valorelli. Mr. Valorelli, please. Those uh, continuance form will be going out to the members either uh, later on tonight or tomorrow via DocuSign. If they could uh, please look at the uh, town email, sign that and get that back to me, it'd be much appreciated. Will do, thank you. Thank you. Um, so vote of the board to continue. Um, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccadelli? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And Ms. Hoffman? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are continued on 82 Grandview Road. And that brings us to the end of our hearings tonight. Uh, so we will return to the administrative items on our agenda. Uh, so these items relate to the operation of the board and as such should be conducted without input from the general public. The board will not take up any new business on prior hearings, nor will there be the introduction of any new information on matters previously brought before the board. Um, after introducing each item, I'll invite the members of the board to provide any questions or comments they may have. Um, so going back, item number two uh, is the vote to approve the meeting minutes from our September 2nd, 2021 meeting. Yes, we are a little behind in our minutes. Um, so these were distributed uh, to members of the board for questions and comments. Um, hopefully everyone has an opportunity to take a look at those and send them back. Um, so uh, are there any further questions or comments on the minutes from September 2nd? Seeing none, um, I will move to approve the minutes. I have a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, so there are four members of the board who are present at, at that hearing who are still members of the board. Uh, so I will just go through those. Mr. DuPont? Aye. Um, Mr. Hanlon? Dane. Stain. Mr. Mills? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. Brings us to item number three, which is the approval of the meeting minutes from September 9th. Similarly <clears throat> distributed to the board um, for questions and comments. Comments sent back to Mr. Valorelli. Are there any further questions or comments in regards to the minutes from September 9th? Seeing none, I move approval. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Abstain. Abstaining. Mr. Mills? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. It brings us to item number four on our agenda, the motion to approve minutes from September 14th, 2021. Um, those were similarly distributed to the board for questions and comments. Are there any further questions or comments on the minutes from September 14th? Seeing none, I move to approve the minutes. May I have a second? Second. Uh, uh, second. Take <laughs> I throw in my I. Throw in. <laughs> DuPont votes aye. Mr. Hanlon. Abstain. Abstaining. Mr. Mills. Aye. Chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. That brings us to the minutes from our October 26, 2021 meeting. Similarly distributed to the board for questions and comments. Are there any further questions or comments that relate to the October 26, 2021 minutes? Seeing none, I move that we approve. I have a second. Second. Aye. DuPont. Mr. DuPont. Abstain. Ah, Mr. Hanlon. Abstain. Abstain. Mr. Mills. Aye. Chair votes aye. So those minutes are approved. Brings us to the motion to approve the minutes from our November 23rd, 2020. These were distributed to the board um, for questions and comments. And are there any further questions or comments on these minutes? I will note that there were only, there are only three members of the board who were present at that meeting who are still members of the board. Um, so uh, Mr. Mills was not available that evening. So uh, 
I move approval. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Mr. DuPont, how do you vote? Uh, aye. Mr. Hanlon? Since there's only three, I'm going to vote aye. <laughs> Very good. And the chair votes aye. Uh, those minutes are approved. That brings us to the minutes from our December 21st, 2021 meeting. These are distributed to the board for questions and comments. Are there any further questions or comments as they relate to the minutes from December 21st? Seeing none, there are six members of the board who are present at that <laughs> meeting who are able to vote. The chair moves approval. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. A vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Abstain. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. That brings us to the minutes from our January 25th, 2022 meeting. These minutes were distributed to the board for questions and comments. Are there any further questions or comments on the minutes from January 25th? Seeing none, the chair moves approval. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. And there are six members of the board who are present um, who can vote on this. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Thank you. Mr. Mills. Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccardelli. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye as well. That brings us to the minutes from March 22nd, 2022. Uh, these were distributed to the board for questions and comments. Are there any further questions or comments as they relate to the minutes from March 22nd? Seeing none, the chair moves approval of the minutes. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. There are seven members of the board who are present at that hearing who are able to vote in the minutes. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Abstain. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Cadelli. Aye. Mr. Huffman. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. The chair votes aye. Those minutes are approved. All right. So that has all the items that were on the agenda. Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. Uh, I just, this is, I don't want this to be out of order, but I have to tell you that on Tufts Road, I was squarely in favor of 8.1.1. And honestly, every time I read that section, I need a cup of coffee and some Tylenol because uh, honestly it's like you know pulling down and connecting dots but I swear I would love to have a, an executive session to go through this <laughs> section of the bylaw and say what does this actually mean here mm. because honestly I thought that there I won't go into the details I'll talk to you about it on another occasion but it really seems at times to be very torturously worded. And I think there's a lot in there, but I just, I, I get a different sense every time I read it. Anyway, no, editorial good. comment, that's all. No, that's good to know. Um, just as a footnote of that, it's, I mean, much of that torturous language is in the state statute. Yeah. Which is impossible and, you know, actually going through this and uh, it's not a bad idea for us i mean to, to just in general have an executive well, i don't know that it needs to be an executive session but a meeting yeah where yeah. we just you know talk about what it means we may have dug in there or something like that but working through that is it's it's kind of hard and uh, it would be useful to have a little bit of, of continuing education on it so that and, and to figure out hard spots and to get help. Yeah. Is that something that might be interesting to pursue with the redevelopment board who also is bound by the confines of this section? I'd I just know. like to get a consensus from the people yeah. we're sitting with here tonight as yeah. to what we think it means and sort of go from there. But yeah. the more the merrier, I suppose. Yeah, this is curious. Um, in, in regards to uh, you know, the interpretation of the zoning bylaws, so the town meeting has just scratched the surface on Monday on the zoning articles. Um, so Wednesday night and possibly the following Wednesday night will both be uh, dedicated to zoning articles. So if anyone is interested in how those play out at town meeting, um, you can feel free to watch on ACMI. <laughs> or I, I 
post to the Arlington list uh, my minutes from the meeting uh, afterwards, so you can just sort of skim the cliff notes, <laughs> as it were. But the articles that the zoning board put forward to the zoning bylaw working group that the ARB put on the agenda, there are six of them, five of them um, still need votes. One of them was approved as a part of a consent yeah. agenda on the first night of town meeting, but uh, those are likely to come up um, this week. If anyone is interested in, in watching that progress. And if you do want to watch that progress, you should be assured that there's plenty of time to go out and get popcorn between the acts. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are, we are not a fast moving bunch on town <laughs> meeting. Um, so the next meeting of the board is set for Tuesday, June 14th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, we have two new hearings on the docket. One is 3840 Newport Street, um, and one is 68 Brantwood Road. And then tonight we continued uh, both 30 Venner and 82 Grandview. So those four will be taking place on Tuesday, June 14th. And then the next meeting after that, uh, Tuesday, June 28th, currently doesn't have anything on the agenda. Are there any further questions for tonight? Seeing none, um, I thank everyone for their participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting. Especially wish to thank Rick Valarelli, Vincent Lee, and Marissa Lau for their assistance in preparing for and hosting this online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It is our understanding the recordings made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Mr. Hanlon, may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the Zoning Board of Appeals to adjourn. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Cadelli? Aye. Ms. Hoffman? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. And the chair votes aye. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Good night, guys. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Everyone. Good night.